I start with the pathology of COPD because this is how the peripheral lung is in COPD compared with normal. And you can see there are two striking differences. The, the most striking difference is that the airway is narrow and distorted and thickened. Uh, and this is because of fibrosis, which is progressive, and a consequence of inflammation. Now, th this is fixed obstruction. There's nothing you can do about this. It's a scar. It's totally unreversible. But there's also another change which is equally unreversible, and that is uh, alveolar wall destruction affecting the alveolar attachments to the airway. So it's not surprising that we see this fixed obstruction in COPD patients. Uh, in contrast to asthma, where the airways are much more reversible because the narrowing in asthma is mainly due to airway smooth muscle contraction. So there's a big difference between asthma and COPD in this respect. Now when normal people breathe out, the airways tend to narrow, but they're prevented from closing by the alveolar attachments that contain elastin fibers. Whereas when COPD patients breathe out, because of the inflammation has led to these pathological changes, it means that on expiration, this narrowing of the airway uh, is exaggerated and can lead to closure. And this means that air is trapped in the alveoli. <clears throat> this is hyperinflation, which is a <clears throat> characteristic physiological finding in COPD, reflected in increased lung volumes, particularly functional residual capacity, which is the resting lung volume. Uh, and these changes as air trapping is made worse on exertion, which is known as dynamic hyperinflation. And this is the cause of shortness of breath on exertion, which is the major symptom of COPD patients leading to reduced exercise tolerance and physical inactivity. But fortunately, there's something that we can do about this and that is to relax small airways with long-acting bronchodilators. And you have a choice between long-acting muscarinic antagonists, uh, the first drug being teotropium bromide, um, but now there are others like glycopyronium, or a long-acting beta agonist like salmeterol and formoterol that are given twice a day, or indicatorol, which is given once a day. Now, this is a study that Trevor and Hansel and I did several years ago uh, when we took glycopyrrolate, which had been around since the 1960s and was used by anesthetists to dry salivary secretions during general anesthesia. And we took this drug and put it in a nebulizer and gave it to people. Uh, because we'd found in vitro that glycopyrrolate was associated with the muscarinic receptors in human lung for a very long time, just like teotropium. And that's why we did this clinical study, and we could see that it has a very long duration of action, exactly the same as teotropium. So we went to the um, Imperial College Innovations that that are involved in patenting drugs. And they said, no, there's no chance of a patent on this because it's a very old drug and the patents run out. Um, having seen these data, a Japanese company then developed glycopyrrolate as a dry powder inhaler and sold it to Novartis for $1 billion that could have been mine. <laughs> And glycopyronium, I, I mean, there's a bit of confusion because it, 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 the drug is called glycopyrrolate, but Novartis changed the name to glycopyronium, so you don't realize it's the old molecule. But this is glycopyrrolate, so I've sort of changed it on slides when I remember to, but, but here it's called glycopyronium because it's a Novartis drug in this study. 
the GLOW-2 trial, comparing head-to-head -head teotropium versus lycopronium. And you can see that they're identical. They have a 24-hour duration of action. Now, what, how are these anticholinergics working in a disease that I showed at the beginning? It looks to be totally irreversible. <clears throat> and the answer is um, from understanding the cholinergic control of the airway. So the vagus nerve is coming down to the airway and it relays in ganglia that are in the airway wall. And from these ganglia, there are short postganglionic fibers that innervate airway smooth muscle and submucosal glands. And th this is through the release of acetylcholine, which acts on muscarinic receptors on these cells. And this leads to mucus secretion and bronchoconstriction. Uh, and this pathway can be activated reflexly from afferent or sensory nerves in the airway for example, from irritants, <clears throat> or from outside the lung, for example, the larynx or esophageal reflux can lead to a cholinergic reflex. Now, in large airways, um, we know that there are a lot of muscarinic receptors on airway smooth muscle because we've actually measured the distribution of these receptors in human airways. And <clears throat> we know that there's a high density of cholinergic nerves in human airways, which is therefore regulating these receptors, leading to bronchoconstriction. But what we found is that you have the same density of muscarinic receptors on small airways in humans. Uh, and yet there are no cholinergic nerves that go to these small airways. So the mystery is what these receptors may be doing. And we now know that acetylcholine is made by several types of cell in addition to cholinergic nerves. Uh, for example, airway epithelial cells contain all of the machinery necessary for making and releasing acetylcholine, which is what they do. And the key enzyme for synthesizing acetylcholine is called choline acetyltransferase. And here you can see that this enzyme is expressed in epithelial cells of human airway. But inflammatory cells like neutrophils, macrophages, and T cells can also make and release acetylcholine. So we think in the periphery of the airway, there's a cholinergic tone, not coming from nerves, but coming from non-neuronal mechanisms. And when we give a llama, the only thing it can do is to block endogenous acetylcholine. It has no other action. And we think that this is uh, something which is happening uh, in large airways from blocking acetylcholine coming from nerves and in small airways uh, coming from extra neuronal sources. Um, and the llamas that we now use, the long-acting drugs, are mainly targeting the M3 receptor, which is the main muscarinic receptor on airway smooth muscle. Uh, there are five subtypes of muscarinic receptor, and three of them are found in human uh, airways. So this preganglionic nerve releases acetylcholine in these parasympathetic ganglia in the airway, and this acetylcholine activates nicotinic receptors, which are ion channels, which then fires the postganglionic nerve to release acetylcholine. Now, uh, this acetylcholine interacts with M3 receptors, which are found on airway smooth muscle cells, and this leads to bronchoconstriction. But in the ganglia, there are M1 receptors, and these M1 receptors act as volume control mechanisms in the ganglion, because normally only a small proportion of the impulses are, it's a very inefficient transmission process. Uh, but if you activate M1 receptors, it increases the efficiency of neurotransmission which means that M1 
activation increases cholinergic bronchoconstriction, just like M3. But at the end of these postganglionic nerves are M2 receptors, and these are feedback inhibitory receptors, which inhibit acetylcholine release. So they're a sort of protective mechanism to prevent excessive acetylcholine release. And when you give llamas teotropium or glycoperonium, we know that they have prolonged inhibition of M1 and M3 receptors, which means they block bronchoconstriction, but they have only transient inhibition of M2 receptors, which you really want to avoid blocking, because blocking M2 increases acetylcholine and therefore makes these drugs less efficient as bronchodilators. So M1, M3 selectivity is optimal for bronchodilator effects. So acetylcholine acts on M3 receptors, and these are coupled to an enzyme, PLC-beta, which then releases the second messenger of cholinergic transmission, which is an inositol trisphosphate, IP3, which releases calcium, leading to bronchoconstriction. But we know on human airway smooth muscle there are also M2 receptors, and these are coupled to adenylate cy cyclase, which uh, normally generates cyclic AMP in response to beta agonists. So adrenaline is the endogenous uh, mediator of beta-2 receptors, uh, and this leads to bronchodilatation. But this theoretically is counteracted by M2 receptors that inhibit uh, this ad adenylate cyclase activation. So you may think M2 receptors uh, should be blocked, but actually we find that in human airway smooth muscle, these M2 receptors are very inactive functionally, which is different from other species. And we can now study the pharmacology of human airways by taking lung slices um, and we can look at small airways down a microscope, which people in our department do, and you can measure the uh, area so that if you add a cholinergic agonist like carbocol, you can see that the airway is contracting because the uh, percent closure is increasing. And then it closes completely, which is the 100% when it's, you can imagine this is then like air trapping. But if you give the same carbocol in the presence of teotropium, you can see that this is stopping the contractile effect and preventing closure. Uh, these uh, frames on the right are actually movies, but I forgot to bring the movie. And you'll, you see that the first one closes and the other one doesn't close because teotropium prevents the closure. I forgot the movie today. Uh, now. What you have in all people is a certain degree of cholinergic tone. So all of us have some cholinergic tone, which is the tonic release of acetylcholine from nerve endings in the airway. And this leads to narrowing of the airway. But in COPD, you also have cholinergic tone. It may be even increased. Uh, but this has a big effect on airway resistance compared with normal people because of the relationship between resistance, which is inversely related to the uh, fourth power of the radius. So it means that when you've got narrowing, any further, even tiny further contraction has a big effect on airway resistance. And we take away cholinergic tone by giving anticholinergics, which are blocking the M3 receptors on, on these um, muscle cells. And even in normal people, if you give them anticholinergics, you can see that airway resistance comes down. But it's a small change in normal people because the airways are, are already f almost fully patent. But in COPD, this has a big effect, and you get a big reduction of resistance because of this geometric relationship. 
Now, the thing that's really, really important to know is that beta-2 agonists have exactly the same bronchodilator effect in COPD patients as anticholinergics. And this is completely different from the situation in asthma, where beta-2 agonists have far greater bronchodilator effects than anticholinergics. And the reason is that in asthma, you have many bronchoconstrictors. So you have mediators mainly coming from mast cells like histamine, leukotrienes, prostaglandins. So these are all contributing to the bronchoconstriction of asthma, as well as cholinergic tone, which, of course, is another component of asthma. And so when you give a beta-2 agonist, it blocks every known bronchoconstrictor mechanism so that it's, it's what we call a functional antagonist. Whereas an anticholinergic is a specific antagonist, it only blocks cholinergic tone. It doesn't block histamine or leukotrienes. Now, if you see anticholinergics and beta agonists are the same, it means that the only reversible element in COPD is cholinergic tone. There is nothing else in this disease at the moment that we are able to reverse. And this is, this is the basis of our current therapy with long-acting bronchodilators. Now, we have a choice between LABA and LAMA, and I can just give you a historical introduction to this study. Um, I think Roberto and Alva were probably there in gold, or maybe it wasn't gold, but some advisory board, when, when we considered if we should recommend a LABA or a LAMA first, what would be your first choice? And, and the decision was that they're equally effective. Uh, but this is because there was one paper published showing that teotropium was better, sponsored by Beringer. Another study showed salmeterol was better, sponsored by GSK. But what was subsequently found is that there were seven trials comparing salmeterol and teotropium. And the five that GSK sponsored showed that teotropium was better than salmeterol were never published. And that's why Beringer then took on a much bigger study comparing teotropium and salmeterol. And you can see that there was an advantage uh, to salmeterol in terms, uh, sorry, to teotropium in terms of reducing exacerbations. I mean, it's, it's small, but it's a significant advantage, but particularly. Uh, for preventing severe exacerbations. So it looked like the first choice should be a LAMA compared with a LABA. But this is not the correct interpretation of the study uh, because we now know that the duration of action is more important than the class of bronchodilator. And when indicatorol came along as the first once daily beta agonist, it was compared with salmeterol twice a day. And you can see that it's better in terms of better effects on symptoms, lung function, quality of life. And the reason why it's better is that because it lasts for over 24 hours, it means that it persists. Uh, whereas salmeterol wears off before you take the next dose. And so that means that they, there are more symptoms because it's not maintaining bronchodilatation in the same way as indicatorol does. Now, if we look at small airways uh, from humans using this uh, precision cut lung slices that I showed you, you can see that formoterol has quite a good bronchodilator effect on these small airways, whereas salmeterol has a rather poor effect. Uh, it's a partial agonist. Uh, so it's not as effective in bronchodilating peripheral airways. Uh, indicatorol, however, is equally efficacious, so it's less potent, but equally efficacious to formoterol, so is behaving more like a full agonist. Uh, but the big advantage of indicatorol compared with salmeterol, apart from this difference in agonism, is the duration of action. So you can see that indicatorol is dilating uh, the airways uh, 22 hours after they've been exposed to the drug in vitro, 
whereas salmeterol has completely worn off. So teotropium is obviously a once a day drug. In fact, in our studies that we did in, in asthma initially with Brian O'Connor, we showed it lasted for three days, which is actually the duration of life of a muscarinic receptor. So probably it's essentially an irreversible anticholinergic and you recover from it by making new receptors. And I think that's a very interesting concept because you may just reduce the synthesis of receptors why you, is why you get such effective and prolonged bronchodilatation. So this is teotropium once a day. And here's formoterol twice a day. You can see how the formoterol wears off before the next dose. But in this study, they combine these drugs, and you can see this additive effect. <clears throat> now, this could be because you ha the teotropium is not at the top of its dose response curve, and you're giving another bronchodilator, so you can see this add on effect. But this study shows that this is not the explanation, uh, at least for the new combinations. So, here's indicatorol. The maximum recommended dose is 300 micrograms a day. And we did a study looking at dose ranging. And above 300, you get a lot of uh, beta agonist side effects like tremor. But in this study, they actually went to 600. So they, they went beyond the, the recommended dose. But there's no benefit. So you get more side effects, but no further bronchodilatation. And it means that 300 is the top of the dose response curve for beta agonists. Since beta agonists are functional antagonists, I mean, they take out cholinergic tone and everything else, there's no possible further bronchodilatation, is what you would think. But the surprise is that if you add glycopyrrolate, you actually double the bronchodilator response. And this is just not explicable by anything we understand at the moment, because this should not happen when you've got to the top of the dose response for beta agonist. And this is a, a big improvement. So here you see the peak is 300 mils, which is one of the biggest bronchodilator responses you would ever see in true COPD patients. Uh, that, that was a short-term study just to look at the uh, additivity. Uh, but now this is translated into longer term studies. So this is a, a, a large study um, looking at glycopyrrolate and indicatorol on their own. And you can see that they have equal effects. And that's because they're both once a day drugs. And it also confirms that teotropium has the same effect as glycopyrrolate. But if you add them together, you see this increase in FEV1, which is significantly greater than either indicatorol or glycopyrrolate alone. So this is important because it means you have additional bronchodilatation in clinical practice. And this <coughs> uh, translates to increased symptoms, although in this study, I must say that the indicatorol glycopyrrolate combination uh, did Increase, in, increase the uh, reduction of symptoms, but the difference was not as great as you might have expected from the FEV1, which is interesting. <clears throat> but this study was more convincing, uh, demonstrating that if you measure dyspnea, shortness of breath, then the indicatorol glycopyrrolate combination, which is called QVA149, is giving about twice the benefit of teotropium on its own. So it means that this additional bronchodilatation is translating into reduced symptoms. Uh, and here you can see that this is something maintained after uh, treating for several weeks. Um, this is a study that Visha was involved in, uh, looking at a comparison between indicatorol glycopyrrolate combination versus teotropium or glycopyrrolate. Again, you see glycopyrrolate and teotropium have similar bronchodilator effects, but the, if you add indicatorol, uh, 
then you significantly improve the FEV1. Uh, and this also has some effect on exacerbation. So you get a, well, we know that vicopyrrolate and teotropium reduce exacerbations. And the reason for that is likely to be explained by the stabilization of airways. Uh, but you get a further reduction if you have indicatorol glycopyrrolate, presumably because the airways are more stabilized. So it's not surprising that uh, many companies are now investing in Lama combination inhalers. So you have indicatorol glycopyrrolate, which is the first, which is now approved, uh, this QVA149 or Ultibro from Novartis. You have Olodaterol and Teotropium, which is in development, and, you met, and then you have Valanterol, Eumeclidinium. Now these are all once a day combinations, and my understanding is that they're exactly the same. So probably it comes down to which device is best or which one is cheapest. I mean, probably they're not so different, these, these combinations. Uh, so you're going to have a big choice. But then there are some other companies that uh, have twice daily combinations. So for Motorol and Teotropium, and the reason they're twice daily is, you, as you've already seen, for Motorol only lasts, it, it has completely gone after 12 hours. So you have to give it twice a day. I mean, it's not suitable for once a day. So some of these are already available. Like for Motorol, Teotropium has already been available for many years in India. Uh, and now for Motorol, Aclidinium is being developed by a Spanish company, Almoral. Aclidinium is a twice a day drug. But I can't see why you would ever want to give a twice daily combination when a once daily one is available. I mean, it makes no sense to me, but maybe people like taking inhaled drugs. Uh, there are other options. There are MARBAs, which are molecule, they're dual function molecules that have a muscarinic antagonist and a beta agonist at, at each end of the molecule. Um, and these have been extremely difficult to develop because you can't balance the activities very well. So this GSK compound, the first one, is almost entirely a beta agonist, whereas other compounds, maybe this AstraZeneca one, is mainly an anticholinergic. And once you've got the molecule, there's nothing you can do because it's a fixed rate. You know, this is a one molecule. You can't change the ratio once you've made it. So these have turned out not to be very beneficial. And then the ultimate inhaler is the triple inhaler that has formoterol, teotropium, and budesonide. One of these is already available in India, the triohale, uh, and others are in development. I mean, several others. But I don't think there's a place for triple inhalers for most patients because, as we heard, in my earlier talk, most patients with COPD don't need the steroid, and most people with asthma don't need the anticholinergic. So they would only be suitable for a small proportion of people. Now, I want to just finish by asking the question. I mean, it's an important question because now we have dual bronchodilators. We need to understand why they work better than the single components, and we don't know. But one explanation is that some people respond better to a LABA and other patients respond better to a LAMA. So if you do parallel trials, uh, you're going to have more overall responders because some will do better with one and some with the other. So overall, they have a bigger response. <clears throat> I think now there are some data against that because you can actually do crossover studies and still show that you get this advantage. It may be that you have a submaximal bronchodilator response. Um, so if you give another bronchodilator, you just give more total bronchodilator. But that indicatorol glycopyrrolate study that I showed demonstrates that that's an unlikely explanation because you're using maximally effective doses of these drugs now. <clears throat> or there could be different different effects of the drug on the airway to improve the FEV1. For example, LAMA uh, inhibit mucus hypersecretion, 
theoretically, although this has never been very clearly demonstrated in COPD patients, uh, whereas LABA theoretically have effects on airway edema that could be a different uh, mechanism of increasing FEV1. And then the, the, the last possibility is that you have a crosstalk between these pathways, which I think is the most likely explanation. So I've already shown the molecular mechanism of uh, cholinergic pathways through calcium release to cause bronchoconstriction. And this is counteracted by beta agonists that are functional antagonists of this constriction through increased cyclic AMP. But this pathway that involves the activation of M3 receptor which generates IP3 that you need for bronchoconstriction, also generates a lipid mediator called diacylglycerol, which activates an enzyme called protein kinase C, which is in the cell membrane. And many years ago, we, we were very interested in protein kinase C and how it regulated um, signaling pathways. <clears throat> and it phosphorylates beta-2 receptors and the coupling protein, GS, that links the beta receptor to adenylate cyclase. And if you phosphorylate these proteins, it dissociates the receptor from adenylyl cyclase, which means that it it reduces the bronchodilator response to LABAs. So when you have cholinergic tone, it means that you may be uh, inhibiting the adrenergic pathway, which means you may inhibit the effects of a LABA. But if you give a LAMA to block this pathway, then you take the break off the adrenergic pathway leading to enhanced bronchodilatation. So there's a crosstalk between the cholinergic and the adrenergic signaling. There is another type of crosstalk um, that could also be happening. So teotropium or LAMA will block this uh, pathway. Uh, and the beta agonist pathway uh, is generating a protein called regulator of G-protein signaling 2, which inhibits the G-protein that couples the M3 receptor to bronchoconstriction. So not only is the cholinergic pathway inhibiting the adrenergic pathway, the adrenergic pathway uh, is inhibiting the cholinergic pathway. So there's a two-way inhibition. So this would then enhance bronchodilatation. So that's why targeting both pathways may give you a better bronchodilator response. <laughs> or there could be interactions outside of the intracellular signaling pathway. So cholinergic nerves release acetylcholine, which lead to bronchoconstriction through M3 receptors on the muscle. And this is blocked by LAMA. Uh, and it's also reversed by LABA, which are functional antagonists. But LABA are having effects on beta-2 receptors on cholinergic nerves to inhibit acetylcholine release. So you could inhibit cholinergic tone by giving a LABA. So again, there's another way that these two pathways can interact. And finally, you, you now have dual bronchodilators. And the question is, are these going to be better than LABA steroid? Well, the answer is that you would imagine almost certainly yes if the steroid does nothing. And this is confirmed by the Illuminate study, uh, which is comparing salmeterol fluticasone or serotide with indicaterol glycopyrrolate. And you can see that in terms of FEV1 improvement, you have a greater effect with the uh, dual bronchodilator than with serotide. Uh, and then uh, <clears throat> here you can see that the area under the curve, which was the primary outcome, is also greater with the dual bronchodilator than with um, the serotide. So in conclusion, cholinergic tone is the key reversible component of COPD that we have at the moment.
and therefore it's the main target for currently used treatments in the clinic. Uh, we know that LAMA uh, work by targeting co this cholinergic tone and this is through blockade of M3 receptors on airway smooth muscle, particularly in the small airways, leading to reduced air trapping. Uh, LABA and LAMA have similar bronchodilator effects, although they work through different signaling pathways. But the important message is that there are additive effects between LAMA and LABA, most likely explained by the crosstalk between the different signaling pathways, and this leads to greater improvement in FEV1, greater reduction in symptoms, greater reduction in exacerbations, and that this strategy is more effective than using LABA steroid combinations. So in my opinion, LABA LAMA combination inhalers are likely to become the key treatment for COPD over the next few years. And that is until we discover uh, some more effective treatment dealing with the underlying disease process. Uh, and that's going to take some time because COPD has turned out to be much more difficult to understand than we thought. And it's going to be many years before we have an effective treatment on the market to deal with the underlying disease and disease progression. So we should maximize the bronchodilatation with the drugs that we have. And this may even have a long-term benefit because by stabilizing the airways, we not only prevent exacerbations, but we may reduce the mechanical forces that could lead to structural changes such as fibrosis, which are important at least for the early progression of the disease. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Peter, for this uh, excellent presentation about uh, this difficult issue and new issue of the dual bronchodilatation. Now, let me, before, quest, uh, uh, before uh, having questions from the floor, let me clarify one, one issue. Uh, it, it occurs to me that you have used the word crosstalk. Uh, instead, um, I mean, to say that it's not only additive, but something else. But you have avoid another term, which is much more precise, which is synergy. It's not synergy. Okay. This is absolutely not synergy. Um, synergy is very yes. is a very multiplicative, ca carefully defined. I mean, synergy in simple terms means more than additive. But you know, synergy. A good example is when you have no effect of drug one, but then when you add drug two, you have a much bigger effect. Although you saw nothing on the first drug. So this is not synergy. No, synergy has never been demonstrated. It's either additive or less than additive but more than just one component. Mm -hmm. Right, now, uh, another point of clarification. Does your recommendation of the dual bronchodilation means that uh, you have to uh, put them in a single device, or no. you can have the same if you give them separately? Because this is an important issue. Yeah. Uh, because obviously there is a lot of marketing and commercial aspects yes. behind it. Well, there are studies that have looked at teotropium and indicaterol and shown these additive effects given by separate inhalers. So th it, these are class effects. I mean, the, the reason for putting them in the same inhaler is that they both have the same duration of action and it's more <laughs> convenient. I mean, it could be argued, maybe Omar would argue that it's better to have them in the same inhaler because they're more likely to go to the same place at the same time, which is certainly important when you're talking about beta agonist steroid combinations. I think less likely to be key with two bronchodilators, but could be. Uh, so you, you can do it with two. I mean, I mean, the issue that I thought you were going to ask me, which I think needs to be addressed, is should you start with one bronchodilator, like teotropium? Oh. And then if, the, if they need more treatment of symptoms, do you then switch them to a dual bronchodilator or do you add the other long-acting bronchodilator? Yeah. 
Um, and my view is, I mean, I don't, I don't know if this is what the, the marketing people are doing, but what I would do is start them all with a dual bronchodilator and start with half the dose and then go to the full dose if they need more. And the reason for that is that then they're used to a single device. I mean, the, the big problem for, for many drugs is that they're made by different companies with different devices. And so, as Omar is saying, that the characteristics of devices are very different. So if you have one MDI, for example, and then a dry powder, they're totally different maneuvers needed to inhale the drugs from those devices. Well, so I, the, the big advantage of the, of the combination is that they're in the yeah. same device. Well, I did not ask this question because, in fact, this is your recommendation, your personal recommendation. This is my personal recommendation. And, and it has not been yet uh, uh, no. uh, shown up by a, a everybody. So this is why I was a bit more shy and not uh, wanted to, uh, to, to but ask. But it depends on the, on the cost as but, well. Yeah, I, mean, the, I mean, teotropium will be generic soon, maybe it is already, uh, so yeah. you, you could give that, but you see I don't think it's a good idea to give teotropium once a day and salmeterol twice a day or formoterol twice a day. I mean y you should give indicatorol once a day and teotropium once a day or glycopyrrhonium like once a day. You want to say something, uh, 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 Omar? Uh, no. No. Our <laughs> Uh, actually, I think he's going to agree with me. My, my question was along these lines. I mean, I, I agree that dual bronchodilation is a very promising combination in COPD. So promising that the question was, is there any role left for LABA alone or LAMA alone? Because you say, oh, it depends on the, how the patient feels. Mm -hmm. But this is, again, very relative because patients adapt their lifestyle to symptoms, so you never know. So why not? I mean, the starting point of every COPD patient is lava lama. No, I, I, but I, I agree with that. And I think, you know, the only thing is whether it's one puff or two puffs, or even three puffs. I mean, I don't know. We have to look into these different doses of these combinations. But I don't see any real point of giving just a lava or a lama, really, unless it's cost. But conceptually, from your talk, is there any reason why we should still keep only one bronchodilator? You show crosstalks. Yeah. But by the way, this is a beautiful example of a network, this crosstalk. <laughs> uh, well, I, yeah, I think you're right, Alva. I mean, I think you want to optimize bronchodilatation. And I mean, the studies are not done yet, but my view would be that you should start treating as early as possible in COPD. Yeah and to stabilize the airways. I mean, I think the indicatorol versus salmeterol study is really interesting because you'd expect they should be about the same, shouldn't you, on bronchodilatation and symptoms, but they're not. And the indicatorol is clearly better in everything you measure. And I think that's because it stabilizes the airway. So we need to keep the airways as open as possible. I mean, basically, the only thing we can do <coughs> to help patients at the moment with COPD, sad to say, is to get rid of their cholinergic tone. I mean, that's all, that's all we can do, I'm afraid. It's pathetic, isn't it? In 2014, when all we do is take away cholinergic tone, and we don't address the underlying disease at all. I mean, it's like when we used to treat asthma, mainly with bronchodilators, they had a terrible outcome, a high mortality, frequent hospital admissions, exacerbations at home, loss of time off work. And it's only when they all got onto inhaled steroids that we could see that asthma in most people can be totally controlled. And we don't have the equivalent drug to a steroid in COPD because steroids don't work. So if we had an anti-inflammatory treatment that worked in COPD, the argument would be that you would start it at the beginning of the disease and then you would be able to prevent the disease developing in a way that leads to the severe airway obstruction and symptoms. Yeah, well, what you have heard over the last uh, few minutes, so this sort of crosstalk, uh, uh, it's, it's a very important therapeutic aspect that has not been still established or officialized. But the point is, 
I mean, maybe this can be a strategy for the treatment of COPD patients to start with maximal bronchodilatation and according to how the patient reacts, just decrease or just uh, move into one or the other until we get sort of stabilization. Yeah. You do a bronchodilation and the patient is fine, why, why do you want to take one off? No. You, you, keep it. Think you, you, you might consider adding an inhaler steroid, Peter. These dr drugs are very safe. I mean, that's the other point to make. I mean, there's no evidence that LABA are dangerous in COPD uh, or LAMA if you use the recommended doses. Still needs to be proven, but, but, but that's a good strategy. Well, Omar. I mean, proven, that's true, but these people have appalling quality of life. And they're, they're prepared. I mean, we, we had an ERS uh, summit on why it takes so long to get new drugs into the clinic. I mean, it's a disgrace. It's getting longer and longer. Uh, and, and the reason is that people are too cautious about potential side effects, which is ridiculous. If you, if you apply the criteria that are applied today by the FDA and others, I mean, European regulators are not as bad as the FDA. But if you apply these FDA criteria, you would never have um, calcium antagonists, you'd never have steroids, you'd never have aspirin, and you would never have digoxin, I mean, or fruzumab. I mean, none of these drugs could have been developed uh, because they're overcautious, and I mean, it's ri quite ridiculous, their attitude, and it needs to change. And, and we had patients at the summit to get their view, and their view is that they're prepared to take a risk. Say you've got a small chance of having a heart attack, <clears throat> like one in a thousand chance. They would take that risk in order to relieve their symptoms, which are happening to them all the time, every day. And we don't allow patients to make that decision. But you decide whether you're going to look left and right when you cross the road. I mean, it's, it's much more dangerous crossing the road than taking all the drugs that are rejected by the FDA.